Now we get to the really serious stuff. Um, I was a press aide to Bobby Kennedy in the 68 campaign, and I remember uh, meeting our guest for the first time uh, at the Cornstock Hotel in downtown Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, he came to me at 11 o'clock at night with an assignment. The senator wanted to give a speech the next day and wanted to reference Lincolnian history. So that was my assignment. I called the editor <coughs> of the Lincoln Star Journal at home. It was about midnight, and I said, we need some help. He said, what is it? And I told him. He said, I'll go down to the newspaper and get you what you need. And he did. And at 1.30 that morning, I delivered the material for the senator's speech, which was crafted by our guest and Adam Olinsky and, and I don't know, I think Jeff Greenfield was there. Anyway, he's, he's an extraordinarily accomplished person. I don't know anyone in the collective life of our country um, that's more principled, has a sense of right and wrong, teaches at Georgetown University, has written this truly significant book, So Rich, So Poor. Will you welcome a, a great friend of all of ours, the wonderful, beloved, and special Peter Edelman. Thank you, George. George is always very good to me. Uh, I wish I wrote more books because we would be here uh, more often. I was here 10 years ago when, when, with Searching for America's Heart, which was more about Robert Kennedy. So George, George, I finally found out he's a five-blade man. I mean, I knew he was sharp, but <laughs> definitely very sharp. Well, uh, this is a great day, isn't it? Um, so, uh, I have to say, I'm pretty surprised. I, I don't know about you. Uh, I was, uh, I had, uh, I mean, this is what you're supposed to do. You discount it, right? You, you get yourself, that's the way the stock market behaves, right? You get yourself ready, and then it turns out really good. So anyway, that, that's, it's a great day. Well, uh, so I've written this book. It's about why so many people uh, are poor in our country. I want to talk to you about it a little bit. Uh, we could start with, uh, other than the fact uh, that uh, the result of this decision is that 16 million people, maybe more than that, will be added to Medicaid. In other words, low-income people will be added to Medicaid. Right. That's <laughs> so it's hard to say uh, with that having happened. And, and uh, those who say uh, Barack Obama didn't do anything for poor people not the case. This is, this is just historic, and there, there's a lot of other things as well. But nonetheless, a uh, pretty bad time for lower income people in our country. Uh, the uh, recession is obviously not over uh, for millions and millions of people. Uh, the politics have turned really, really <coughs> ugly. Uh, and uh, we see Paul Ryan and others in Congress uh, proposing massive cuts in programs for low-income people and uh, kind of sticking it right in everybody's face in terms of <coughs> proposing further income tax cuts at the very top. Uh, um, so we could spend our time talking about that, but that's not what I'm, it's not my purpose. My purpose really is to talk, and it's the purpose of the book, uh, is to talk about a larger framework. Why, why uh, are we where we are on these? Uh, issues. Uh, now, now, just for openers, uh, Ronald Reagan, of some memory to people here, uh, said that we fought a war uh, against poverty uh, and uh, poverty won. Wrong. Not the first time or the last time he was wrong. But important to understand that uh, we have policies and you all know this in terms of uh, enumerating many of them, but Social Security on through food stamps and uh, earned income tax credit and, and so on. These programs are keeping 40 million people out of poverty. That's something. 
So anybody who says what Reagan said or that nothing works uh, or that it's all a failure, not true. At the same time, if we're keeping 40 million people out of poverty, we'd have 86 million instead of 46 million, the way we measure poverty, which is another subject because we don't measure it very well. Um, and we had the lowest poverty back in the early 70s that we'd had since we started measuring. It got down to 11.1. Percent, and when Bill Clinton left office, it was 11.3 percent. Um, hmm, that doesn't sound like very much progress. And of course, since that time, since 2000, we've had 15 million more people added to the roles of the poor in this country, almost a 50 percent increase uh, in, in, since uh, the beginning of the new century. So what is that about? Um, all these great policies, programs that have accomplished so much, poverty being uh, the same 70s, 2000s, some big ups in between, uh, and, and worse now. Well, that's what we want to talk about. And, and the, the point that we're not focusing on enough uh, as a country, there, there are a number of points, but number one, um, low wage work. The uh, economy really changed, and I'm not telling anything, telling you anything you don't know, really changed, started to change uh, in the early 70s. The manufacturing jobs, the good jobs uh, went away, were replaced, that's good, they were replaced by all these low wage jobs. I mean, we know that. But focus on how many people that involves. 103 million people, a third of the people in this country have jobs that uh, bring in, uh, even with two people working, um, that, that bring in less than twice the poverty line. In other words, less, less than $46,000 for a family of four. A third of the American people. And every one of these things, you know, we know the jobs went away, but every, every one of these uh, numbers that I'm going to sh share and talk about there is significant. I just don't think we focus on, on the, the magnitude. So uh, what happened, not only do we have all these low wage jobs, but in fact, uh, they haven't gotten to be any more uh, remunerative. They, 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 the, the wage is almost the same as it was, in real terms, almost the same as it was in 1973, $34,000 a year for the median job in this country, right? It's one job all year long, full time. So if you've got two people you can send out to work, uh, sort of fine, better. Uh, and a lot of people did that. Uh, and of course, uh, they ran out of workers after that. But there's so many more moms who, single parents, but they're mostly moms who are trying to make it and support their kids. So we've gone fr from having the elderly be uh, the poorest group in the society to children being the group, poorest group in the society because that mom by herself going out to find a job um, can't support that family too often. Quarter of the jobs pay um, less than the poverty line for a family of four. Uh, and the wage has increased, as I say, it's been stuck, but it's, it's gone up by 7% over 38 years. In other words, a fifth of a percent a year. So this is a huge problem, and, and on top of that, the, the great American dream of mobility, if you look at the work of the Pew Mobility uh, Project, uh, it's kind of not so anymore. And again, it's sort of, unfortunately, it's common sense when you think about it because um, there just isn't much of a, of, a, of a possibility. It's a kind of a pyramid. Now, was there, uh, was the whole economy stuck? No. I mean, we know that it's 1%, 99%. We now even have terminology about it. And all of the growth stuck at the top. Uh, so that's problem number one, and, and uh, it's not just the wages, it's also the mobility uh, has, has essentially 
been tremendously upward mobility, tremendously constricted. Second thing um, th that we need to be aware of, this is all make you so cheerful, but we're happy today. Uh, deep poverty. We, we have 20 million people now who have incomes below half the poverty line, uh, below uh, about $19,000 for a family of three. Um, why is that? Well, it has a lot to do with what's happened, again, to women and children. It has a lot to do with what's happened to what, what we call welfare, cash assistance for, for families, which is typically for uh, mother, mothers and children. 